Shabbat Shalom. Today's message is titled The First Two Commandments. I'm going to talk about the importance, uh, historical significance of the first two commandments, uh, of the Ten Commandments, um, and bring it all the way in up until modern times. Uh, so let's get right to it. Uh, Exodus 21 through 6. Then Elohim spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other Elohim before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them nor serve them. For I, Yahweh your Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing favor to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. So first off, we start with the context. It's always good to start with the context. In the case of the Ten Commandments, we, we almost always look at these as a list, which they are, uh, on a plaque, completely div divorced from Exodus 19, Exodus 18, Exodus 17, and, and, and the actual happenings as to when these were given. So what had just happened in, in the scope of history is that Yahweh had just executed 10 plagues to decimate the Egyptians. Back then, and it should be today, but back then, if a nation was great and powerful, the people would equate that to the gods that they worshipped. And so Egypt was the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. It was a humongous empire. Uh, it held all the wealth, and it was had a huge army, and it had gods. And its leaders thought they were themselves gods as well. And so uh, the people would perceive that is that Egypt was great because of the gods that they served. Well, Yahweh had executed 10 plagues uh, to decimate the Egyptians by shaming their gods, by showing that he's more powerful by far than anything that they worshipped. Now, today, most of the Western world doesn't acknowledge this truth, but it's still true. Uh, when we follow the God of the Bible here in the West, we, we actually are better. And we're better because if we follow the, the Ten Commandments, if we follow the ethics and morals of the Bible, society is generally better organically, but also because Yahweh will bless us for doing those. Uh, these two commandments could actually be construed as one uh, because they, uh, because they complement each other. Uh, the first commandment says, I'm Yahweh, you know, you have no other Elohim before me. And then he goes to contrast the worship of the other Elohim. So up until this point in history, Yahweh was kind of coy about his actual name. Uh, in this context right here, just think about what happened. Ten plagues, two million people leave Egypt Mixed, they're a mixed multitude. It's not all Israelite. There's a lot of people mixed in there with them. And so they leave Egypt. The, the Red Sea closes, kills all the Egyptian army. They're completely safe. They're completely crossed over. They're on the other side of the Red Sea, can't really go back. And then the, uh, the pillar of the fire and the cloud come down on the top of Mount Sinai. Everybody's assembled at the base, and you get a sound. A sound like many waters, like many voices saying, I'm Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, who brought you out of the house of slavery. He introduces himself at this point and tells him his name and says, I'm the God who just defeated Egypt. So when Moses got commissioned, I think it's Exodus 3, to be to be the the effectively the Messiah. He's never called the Messiah, but he does the Messiah role. But the the emissary, the the one to to go to represent Yahweh to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians. Moses goes, yeah, wait a minute. Um, what are you called? What about who do I tell him sent me? And he says, I share Haya, uh, Asher sent me. I am that I am sent you. And um, 
And Moses goes, um, okay, and he marches on. Well, we know that the word Yahweh means self-existent ones, and so does the, the phrase that Yahweh used to explain himself in Exodus 3. And so he goes on, but he didn't want them to want Moses to go and say, okay, look, here's the name of this, of the, the God of Abraham is this name, and he's great, trust me. What happens is that Yahweh destroys the Egyptians methodically over a span of time with 10 specific plagues. And then he says, I did that. You worship me. I don't want to hear about those other gods because I just destroyed them. This is a very confident and, and powerful method of communication because like if, if you are working with somebody who's you know they're going to make their mistakes and you let them make the mistakes and then you go and you let them learn from their mistakes that's kind of a mature way of communicating in this case he destroyed everybody and then he introduces himself as the person who did it so his name should be associated with his deeds with his character not a name associated with greatness the way that we measure uh, greatness and now for those who follow this um uh you know these channels the places that this goes out you know that i'm i'm a big uh, proponent of letting people know that the numbers in the bible and the chapters aren't really there and that you shouldn't read them but in this case they are there the ten commandments are numbered Exodus 34:28, Deuteronomy 4:13, and Deuteronomy 10:4 specifically refer to these commandments as the Ten Commandments. Except they don't really call them commandments. It says ten words, ten debarim, right? And the words are ten utterances of Yahweh, which are commandments. And some are thou shalt, and some are thou shalt not. And and um, the word debarim is plural, and it could be, you know translated a number of ways but when Yahweh, when Yahweh utters a word a commandment it's a commandment even though if it calls it a word and particularly when it says you shall or you shall not but the point is that the ten commandments are actually numbered but the set of them comprise an actual unit so they do complement each other and they are worked together as one unit and what it tells us is that our behavior shows our devotion our behavior because the ten commandments aren't aren't thou shalt believe the ten commandments are not a doctrinal statement and um, modern christianity or christianity for the past hundreds and hundreds of years has been a doctrinal academic exercise that doesn't really put a lot of weight on on behavior but on belief just just the ethereal belief um, but that's not what the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Yeshua is all about. That that faith is actually about a behavior. And so these, these ten words are dictating how people who have Yahweh as their Elohim will behave. So his behavior identified him, and then he introduces himself. Now he tells us that we behave properly to identify ourselves as his people it's a very uh, in, in, interesting way of thinking and it's different from western thought this is uh kind of different than uh, uh than the way we here in the west are raised uh, a way of thinking um i was not saying that you can't think like a westerner and just read the ten commandments and do them but i'm trying to uh to kind of elevate the discussion and educate here so the second commandment is intertwined with the first. Regardless of the God, idolatry was the principal worship tool of the false gods of the day. Uh, you had Molech, you had uh, the gods of Canaan, you had uh, um, Baal, you had all these Egyptian things and whatever, and they would make statues to them and they would have all these rituals and stuff like that. And so he always drawing a contrast with the second commandment. He's saying not to worship the way the nations do, but the way that people will identify whose God you serve is by the lack of idols. He's unique in that he is so big and so powerful, have really has no form, even though Yeshua is the image of the Elohim, 
Elohim, our Elohim, Yahweh, transcends time, transcends space, transcends all the dimensions, um, and he's all-powerful, all-knowing, an immense thing, and so there is no image that could even do justice to him uh, because he made everything. So um, he um, is huge in that realm. And the second commandment is telling us how not to worship him, which is in effect telling us how to worship him by purging our lives of anything associated with idolatry or false religions, which gets to this first century Christianity theme uh, that we have at this assembly is, is that we are getting rid of the, the Christmas, the Sunday, the Easter, the pagan stuff, the Trinity stuff, all these things that came from other concepts that don't belong in the Bible, that don't belong in the faith. We get rid of them to show who we really worship, which is Yahweh through his son, Yeshua. And so it, there's another really important thing that's happening here is that the, the Israelites, the mixed multitude, were saved before they really knew who Yahweh was or what he wanted them to do. He destroyed the Egyptians to bring his people out of Egypt, and then he told them who he was. This same pattern applies to every single believer. When we're called, we, we take the leap before we're studied. This is another thing where Christianity has turned it upside down, where they make you study doctrine and accept doctrine before they'll baptize you. But that's never in the Bible. The Bible, the people are baptized and then they start learning. So you, you accept Yahweh as your Elohim and Yeshua as your Messiah, and then you move forward with the learning, which is an incredible parallel with the way that the Hebrews were saved from the Egyptians and then Yahweh introduces himself and tells them how he wants to live. And so now he's talking about his worship here and he says, you're not to make images for worship. Now I know it says you're not to make an idol or anything. And then it says you shall not worship, worship them. But the idea that we can't have artwork and stuff is not, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't make sense that we can't have images at all and most particularly because of this next slide here. Here in Exodus 25, 18 through 22, you shall make two cherubim of gold and make them of hammered work at the two ends of the atoning cover. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end, and you shall make the cherubim of one piece with the atoning cover at its two ends, and the cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the atoning cover with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned towards the atoning cover. Then you shall put the atoning cover on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the atoning cover, from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about every commandment that I will give you for the sons of Israel. So here's a balancing act, because he says, don't make any object of anything in the heavens above, whatever, for the purpose of worship. And then in Exodus 25 here, he's actually commanding them to do exactly that. Um, we know that idolatry is not to be tolerated whatsoever. When Moses came down the mountain and discovered the golden calf and, uh, and that worship, they were absolutely busted and paid a huge price for the disobedience. Um, but the prohibition on idols just simply doesn't go to artwork because we know the tabernacle and the temple were both commanded to be made with images of things and the people who had the ability to construct and make the artwork were honored and listed in some parts of the Bible. So common sense dictates uh, that this is about making images for worship, for idolatry, images that represent false gods or made up gods or made up beliefs and stuff like that. Uh, this isn't uh, about not making any images whatsoever. But how do we reconcile these angelic beings being incorporated into the worship of Yahweh? Well, you know what? That's for him to explain. I, I brought this slide in today just to be completely upfront and transparent that sometimes you do have to just say, I don't know. And uh, perhaps someday we'll know what these images were really all about. Uh, but today is not that day. Now here in Exodus 22 and 3, again, 
It says, I'm Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other Elohim before me. And in Revelation 9, 20 through 21, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their witchcraft, nor of their sexual immorality, nor of their thefts. So if we if we look at these two things, and it wouldn't be a, a messianic message without some deep dives into language, um, we're going to take apart this these two verses here, or the Exodus 20 for sure. Um, in Exodus 20, the before me, this is a very long story, okay? Because it doesn't really say before me in Hebrew. That's the best the translators could do there. And to back it up, we start at the beginning, beginning of the verse where it says, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Elohim is the plural equivalent to the word gods. It really means mighty ones or great ones. El is the singular for God. Elohim is plural. When you see plural Elohim with a singular uh, article in front of it or a singular noun, this is Yahweh or I am, then that is reserved. That is a very special way that the Bible is written to identify the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God, uh, the God Yahweh, is that he is a is plural uh, with singular, and so it's bad grammar. You would never do this um, in English. I can't think of a, a way to do it poorly in English. In Spanish, it's pretty easy because Spanish has. Um, where the articles and the and the articles have to follow the plurality and the gender of the nouns, uh, so you know this would be like saying el perros, like the dogs, but but the is plural in Spanish when it's in front of a plural word. Same with Hebrew. Here, if this was to be correct, it would say I am Yahweh your El, or we are Yahweh your Elohim. But it doesn't do that. This is what's called the plurality of majesty. This is where a lot of people get start looking and trying to put the Trinity into the into the into Elohim into being God. But that's that's not about this whatsoever. That that's a thought that came hundreds of years after the close of Scripture. So so that's not here whatsoever. Um, but to just understand that the plurality of majesty and the reason why I have Elohim on here. And Yahweh is, is so that you can actually see what it really says. So now to take this long story and turn the corner, before me is Alpanaim, right? Panaim is faces. So Al is the, you shall have no other Elohim, the faces. Mean or Al before or, or to or from or whatever Al can mean, it mean a bunch of stuff. So again, the plurality of majesty is at the beginning of this verse and at the end of this verse. And so it's kind of a mirroring thing. So what it would literally say here, if I look at my notes, um, is you shall have no other Elohim in front of my faces, which is confusing. It's very, very confusing to think of it that way. What he's trying to communicate here is that nowhere that I can see Will you have any idols? Where can Yahweh see? Everywhere. So this doesn't mean that you can't have any any gods before him, after him. It's not before and after. The before means in his presence or anywhere around him. And he's eternal and omnipotent and omnipresent and omne everything. So that means... This is the most comprehensive way whatsoever of saying no false gods, no other gods, no idols, none, bupkis, period, end of story. And I wanted to take some exposition on that because sometimes people will just read this in the English and think that, oh, you know, you don't have any other gods before me. Well, that means you can have them after him. Well, that doesn't mean that whatsoever. It means don't even go there. So what does the commandment not say? This is where some controversy comes in as well, because the commandment does not say there are no other Elohim. It doesn't say I'm Yahweh who 
your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. There are no other Elohim. He says, you shall have no other Elohim before me. We, we have to come to grips with the fact that, that some of these demons, the, the third of the angels fell, and they've got powers, and they've got abilities, and they've got influences that we do not have. These demons do. And they're going to be like Elohim. They're going to be like God. They're angelic beings. And some of the things, some of the false gods are made up in imaginations of men. Some of them are actually representations of demons. And we have to be very careful to omit this stuff from our, um, you know, from our worship whatsoever, which is why some of us take these, you know, these, these things about Sunday, Christmas, Easter, Trinity, so getting rid of them so seriously because it is a very very serious thing we have to be very careful about that satan's biggest tool his biggest tool of 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 convincing is to convince people that he doesn't exist and that neither does god and that we all are here on our own volition and there's no bad guy and there's no good guy and then he can snare us in through ignorance but he does exist and he is quite powerful and the um um, the false prophets of Egypt were able to do some of the stuff that Moses could do. They, they didn't get to stand in the presence of Pharaoh because they were powerless. They were able to conjure some dark arts and do some stuff. And that's pretty scary. We also have to remember that King Saul, when he visited the conjurer, she did conjure up Saul. So the dark arts do work, and Yahweh commands us to not do stuff because we're not to do it. And, uh, and so just, just keep that in mind, because a lot of Christian ministers will tell you, well, there aren't any other false gods. They're not real gods anyway. They're just this and that and the other. And most of the time, the Bible does mock idols and say they aren't real. You could just knock them over or whatever, which is true. But they represent something that could very well be real. And we have to not invite uh, these demons and stuff into our into our houses or into our fellowships or into our worship. And now we go to Revelation 9, 20 through 21. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their witchcraft or of their sexual immorality or of their thefts. So the um, um, it shows that mankind is actually going to be held accountable for idolatry. And, and it appears that they're going to be held accountable because they should have known better than to worship demons and the idols of gold, silver, and brass. Today, is it, it, that couldn't be more true than ever today because we have Bibles... We have the ability to come to the knowledge of the truth everywhere. You have a smartphone. You can have every Bible translation. You can have it read to you. You can listen to these messages or other people's messages. I mean, there is no shortage of biblical teaching today. But mankind continues to persist to worship demons principally and also uh, idols. Now, we don't see a lot of idolatry in the West specifically. But we do it through syncretism by bringing in pagan worship into the faith. And a lot of people do it without even knowing it, which, again, is why we don't do specific things at our assembly that others do. So let's take a look at the uh, New Testament now, because uh, we do want to you know, make a comprehensive look at this. And in Matthew 22, 36 to 38, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the Torah? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So this is the great and foremost commandment. Well, that is called the Shema, which is, you know, uh, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, right? You, you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. It, this is this is a reference to the first, you know, commandment, the first two commandments, three, four commandments, uh, because Yahweh is one. You worship him completely. So the Jews of the first century in Yeshua's ministry, they didn't really have a significant problem with idolatry. Um, well, the Israelites, the Jewish people, 
they didn't really have a problem with idolatry. Uh, they were occupied by the Romans, and the Romans were idolaters, and they kept themselves from that. Uh, Hellenism, uh, which is the Greek philosophies and Greek thinking, did had crept in a lot at that point, and may and probably I'd like to say that it probably has never even left completely. Um, the Greek philosophies uh, did get in there because I'm reading uh, Philo these days, who was a Jewish rabbi from Alexandria, lived at the same time as Josephus and Paul, and he um, is definitely very immersed in Greek uh, Greek type of of thinking, Western thinking. For those who don't know, our our institutions uh, here in the West, in America, you know, Britain, Australia, Europe. Canada, uh, you know, all of Latin America, we all are all Greek thinkers. Um, it's the way we are brought up. Uh, it's the way that we are taught the systematic uh, uh, education of the West. And and you'll know this, it's not, this is not something that we could really undo. Um, but if you think about when you in your middle school, and they first start teaching you how to, how to write an essay, what do they do? Roman numeral one. And then ABC, Roman numeral two, ABC. That, that Roman numeral one isn't an accident. It's like, why are we using Roman numerals, right? We're not Romans. That's not an accident. But the way we organize our thoughts and our minds in the West is is in a Western fashion. And we have, we who read the Bible, you know, study the Bible, we start to see that that doesn't really fit when we start reading the scriptures. We look at the book of Revelation, it appears to tell the same story seven or th uh, three times the book of isaiah appears to repeat itself a lot because the the hebrew culture is more eastern and it organizes thoughts in a different fashion than the west does um but the uh, uh you know the reason i bring this up is is that you know the idolatry of the first century was restricted or was was kept away from the Jews. Uh, the first time the temple came down, as, as you know, the guy who built the temple was Solomon. Well, see, Yahweh built the temple, but through Solomon. And Solomon was supposed to bring Hebrew thought and Hebrew fellowship to the world through that temple. All the people of the world were supposed to come to Israel to witness this marvel and say, where did you get the wealth? How could you have done this? And, and Solomon was supposed to say, Yahweh is my Elohim, and the reason that we have this blessing is because we worship him and him alone, and if you want to be blessed like this, you do the same thing as us. Here's the Torah. Take a Torah home, take a couple home, and go teach your people to stop worshiping false gods, and you can be blessed like this too. That's not what happened. Solomon allowed the idol idols to come in, and a couple hundred years later, that temple came down, and they went into... Uh, captivity for 70 years, one year for each sabbatical year that they did not observe. So idolatry and syncretism was the reason the first temple came down. That is not the reason the second temple came down. Second temple Jews refused the idols, and Rome was trying to force it on them, and they would not do it. Second temple came down. Does anybody know why? It came down because Daniel associates the Messiah coming with the fall of the temple, so the faith will go forth from Zion. That's in Daniel 9, I believe. So, uh, just so to understand that, uh, what I was trying to say here, in, in a long, drawn-out fashion, is that the idolatry was not really a problem for first-century Jews, even those outside the land who were attending synagogue. They were pretty good about, you know, sticking to the Torah and the rabbis, and they did have some Hellenism, but that's not why the Second Temple uh, came down at all. Where did the first century believers have to deal with idolatry? Well, that's an easy one. Everybody knows. You know, we go to Acts 19, not 26 to 27. Um, you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made by hands are not gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours will fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. 
See, idolatry in the faith became a really big deal after the curtain got split in two and the apostles went out to proselytize, to go out to evangelize. And the spirit went ahead of them. And Paul was so successful at getting people to get rid of idol idolatry that the there was a riot and the merchants were upset about it. And he's saying in all of Asia, Paul does this, that he's got a reputation of getting people to stop with the idolatry. That is an uh, immense blessing. And it is also a big proof of people who believe like us that, that the first century believers were Torah followers. Uh, it wasn't just a, you know, accept Yeshua and believe type stuff where you could just keep doing what you're doing, right? That's not true at all. They got rid of their idols and to the point where the Temple of Artemis, which is a giant structure, um, could have been regarded as worthless, which it ultimately was, rightfully so. Um, and uh, way ahead of myself on this stuff. Um, but the uh, but I was talking about with King Solomon is that everybody was supposed to come to Israel to learn the truth. This is a juxtaposition against that, where now they're leaving Jerusalem to go out in the world and find people who are wrapped up in the paganism and get they're called by the Holy Spirit and they get to come out of Babylon wherever they are. That's exactly the same as where we are today. As you've read your Bible and you've sat in church, you've sat in your Sunday churches and you've heard all these excuses as to why they're in church on Sunday instead of Shabbat and why they're doing Christmas instead of uh, the real holy days, why are they doing Easter instead of the real holy days, doing all this pagan stuff. Well, that's the same situation as we are in today here in the West, right? Where we are being called to this truth out of the, out of the outside the land, wherever we are, and we're to stay converted exactly where we are. And that's, that's a big change uh, with, the, um, with the New Testament. And now when Yahweh sends his Ruach to pave the way, We've got Yeshua as our high priest who intercedes for everybody who accepts him as a Messiah, and we shed our pagan ways. Our difference is that we're shedding pagan ways that are accidentally or intentionally put into Christianity. And we're getting rid of them to go with the pure. And back in the day, they were getting rid of the pagan to just go with the Torah and, and to follow the ways of the first century believers. So... Um, Let's move it into the uh, into the here and now, though. Uh, in Romans 1, 21 to 22, Paul wrote, wrote, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasonings, and their, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible mankind, birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. So, in Romans 1, what happens here is that Paul is saying mankind always do better than to worship animals and images of animals and f false things, to worshiping the created. And because of that, they were given a punishment. And if you read on what the punishment is, it's homosexuality, promiscuity, and all kinds of social problems. So, the, so in our reasoning today here in the West, the Christian West, is that we try to look at the problems to get people to come back to, you know, to to right living, but the right live the root cause of all this is is worshiping the wrong stuff. If you worship the wrong stuff, then Yahweh will turn you over to your passions and say, okay, fine, here you can do you can deal with it, and that's where our society is today. The cycle continues. Um, the cycle continues because mankind is so stubborn, and they just will not recognize the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Yeshua. They will not do it. There is an increase of people following Wicca today. You can even see soldiers and uh, Marines and stuff saying until Valhalla, which is the afterlife of Norse gods, which everybody knows Norse gods are false gods. They're not gods. They're just myths. It's not even a real thing. And Wicca is the worship of the earth and witchcraft. And uh, there's an increase in yoga today, which is a pagan religion from India. And it seems that our society is just bent on going in the wrong direction, no matter how much of our knowledge increases. And if you think today about the most 
popular coffee out there, maybe it's still the most popular coffee, is Starbucks. And their logo is Artemis of the Ephesians. That's what their logo is. And people are walking around carrying these cups with a false goddess on it. And it's it's bizarre because the people who put that logo on there did it on purpose. They know exactly what it is. They're not even hiding it. They're not, they, they are, tr maybe they're trying to rub their noses or rub uh, our noses in our faith or whatever, or just to show how ignorant Christians are. But these things are all around us. And as we look in the book of Revelation, we can see that mankind is going to be held accountable and that we should have known all along. So what do we do? And our job as believers in first century Christianity is, is to persist in the faith once delivered. We're to, to keep putting one foot in front of the other, keep reading our Bibles, and keep studying and understanding that the faith of that we're supposed to be walking out is pretty simple. It's, you know, Ten Commandments, Holy Days, no unclean food, you know, just do what Yahweh said, live as Yeshua lived, accept Yeshua as your Messiah, get rid of the pagan stuff, and, imp and improve yourself with each day. So thank you so much for listening. It's Shabbat Shalom, and please drop by uh, firstcenturychristianity.net for more teachings like this, and like and share it wherever you may see it. Have a blessed week, brothers and sisters.